Now time to review the papers, both local and international. We have Dr. Constance Koko, a journalist, uh, uh, political commentator. Good morning, uh, Constance. Good morning, good morning, Andy. Good morning. Uh, I was about to call you at this one. I'm <laughs> 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 good, good morning. morning. I hope you had a good weekend. Oh, boy. Okay, this one is gone, so it's just three of us. It happens. Well, to look at the papers today, we have Dr. Yobosa Wugaren. He is the editor of Nations Capital of this day and secretary of the Nigerian Guild of Editors. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Well, hello there and welcome viewers. I will begin with this day newspaper. In this day, at NBA conference, Tinubu vows to protect rule of law, tolerate dissenting voices. President Bola Ahmed Tinubu has vowed to keep promoting the rule of law, adhere to the principles of separation of powers, and tolerate dissenting views within the ambit of the laws of Nigeria. He said his administration had made steady progress in the effort to rebuild the country through legal and judicial reforms. The president was speaking as he declared open the annual general conference of the Nigerian Bar Association. He was represented by the vice president, Kashim Shetima. I mean, the judiciary in focus once again at the MBA conference. From this speech delivered by the vice president on behalf of the president, they seem to have given their administration a pass mark in regard to judicial reforms and um, adhering to the separation of powers. What do you make of this uh, statement or declaration, uh, Yobosa? Well, the president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria has no option than to you know, um, imbibe the rule of law because we're in democracy. Democracy um, uh, you know, requires that um, we must abide by the rule of law because it deepens the demo democratic process. Uh, it enables um, citizen participation in the democratic process. It uh, enhances um, accountability and transparency in governance. And it promotes good governance, protect human rights. And so in a democracy, uh, the president has no option than to, uh, you know, to protect rule of law and tolerate dissented voice. Uh, because uh, in democracies, everybody cannot agree. Uh, there must be dissenting voice. And it is the ability of the president to aggregate those dissenting voice and see how he can manage it. Uh, and that is what is, what is required in a democratic process. And that's what is required in democracies. So uh, the president has no option than to protect the rule of law. Right, he, he doesn't. And you know, as the NBA conference holds, I think there's also the focus on the job of the Nigerian Bar Association. They haven't exactly pulled their weight in recent times, uh, NJ. Well, the, the point is that, yeah, like you also said, uh, a rule of law is the plank upon which democracy you know, rest. But the point is when the president sa says uh, tolerating dissenting voices, that's why you will get some people now disagreeing. Remember we talked about, we discussed last week, I think, so about Onayeko, yeah. uh, Falano, the case of the uh, demonstrators who were still incarcerated, mm -hmm. and Onayeko saying that if really you, you tolerate dissenting voices, then you should let those people go because they're not the problem except for those who committed crimes. Otherwise, if they were really protesting, uh, because like what Onayeko said, you can't flog a child and tell him not to cry, that they're not the problem of the country. And like Falano said, if they don't get to be released, they probably go to court and try to get those people out. Even the ABA, NBA, you know, are, are standing in for, for those people. So if you talk about tolerating dissenting voices, some, in some quarters, uh, they might find that speaking from two sides of your mouth. But, uh, of course, the rule of law is the plank upon which democracy stands. And even the word tolerate, I mean, <laughs> there should be dissenting voice. Tolerate sounds like you barely, mm. you barely, No, 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 you to know, tolerate, listen, uh, you just know. like in, in marriage, <laughs> you know, you, you, can, you can't live life without uh, uh, learning to give and take, yes. you know, you know th that, that's just it. Well, um, Everyone will be watching. Let's move on to Guardian newspaper. Okonji Owala asked politicians to stop weaponizing insecurity. She spoke at the MBA conference too. She said, and I quote, we have politicians who believe that the best way to make their opponents look bad is to instigate insecurity, making it look like they can't govern, regardless of whether this leads to loss of lives and property of innocent Nigerians. This has to stop. 
I mean, Dr. Okonjo Wale certainly hit the nail on the head. Remember the famous threat from a, 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 a part of the country when Goodluck Jonathan was president? They told him that they will make the country ungovernable. And they did make the country ungovernable, and Nigeria has yet to recover from that threat and the insecurity that has spiraled out of control since then. Yobosa, it's politics of self-interest rather than service that we are seeing. Well, well, that's kind of politics we play in, uh, in Nigeria and in other uh, developing country uh, where people believe that if they are not in power, they must do everything to frustrate the government uh, of the day. Like you rightly said, um, when Jonathan was in power, uh, some section of the country said, look, they were going to make the country ungovernable uh, for him. And, and uh, you, you, we all saw what happened throughout his uh, uh, years in government. We saw a growing insecurity across the country. It got, to a, it got to a point when he was seeking re-election, they now used the insecurity across the country against him. And they said he was very weak and he was not capable of governing the, the country. You know, meanwhile, they were the one, the same people who instigated the insecurity. And even when he was contesting, the, the, the same people also vowed that, where, that if the man is declared winner of the president of Nigeria, and that uh, they will form a parallel government. And for me, and that's exactly what Okuji Wola was referring to. If you also look at what is happening in Niger data today, look at the insecurity across the Niger data, the illegal air bulkery. These are issues, these are uh, actions that were, that were instigated by people who believe that if they are not in power, then nothing will work. So for me, um, Okuji Wola is, say, is just raising the issues. We know these things are happening. This has been happening in Nigeria, actually since 1999 where we uh, we, we, we return to civilian government. You know, insecurity has far-reaching and profound consequences. and It consumes everyone, as we can see today. Yes, it does. And she really pointed that out. I know Okonjo Wala is someone who doesn't mince her words. And that was a loaded statement from her. She's a global figure. She's deeply rooted in our country's sort of social, political um, fabric. Pointing out that some politicians are turning this insecurity for their gain, is not something to take lightly. Who is suffering from it? It's the people, it's the communities where all this uh, insecurity is going on, fostering fear, just deliberately stoking chaos. It's like setting fire to your own house to prove that the alarm system doesn't work. That's a very good example. It's, it's just yeah. chaotic and just saying that and saying it in such a place at the MBA conference, I think the MBA conference is a good stage to actually say all these things. It's a very big stage. Like we just talked about what the president was saying. It's a good stage to say all these things. You also have Femi Favlana, uh, the human rights uh, lawyer and activist, also talking about how the legal profession should uh, take a hard stance against illegal arrest and illegal detention. He was basically saying that, look, all these reforms that the administration say they are doing uh, in the judicial reform system, if they don't take a hard stance on illegal arrest, illegal detention that we always see in the Nigerian system, that we're not ready to go anywhere. Right. And so I think there's been a lot of calls, a lot of um, hard statements at uh, this MBA conference, and it just only kicked off. Right. The New Telegraph, we'll be looking at New, telegra uh, new Telegraph, Southeast Nas Caucus laments region's exclusion from Nelfon student loan. Nelfon is the Nigerian education loan fund. The Southeast National Assembly caucus says beneficiaries from the region are not included. Out of the money disbursed from 19 institutions, no institution from the East was found on the list. Nelfon has um, defended itself. It says it sent a verification note to these institutions. They have on responded well the point here is that okay a problem has been identified so they can now rectify it whoever is at fault i think we should blame the institutions in the side is uh, blame them we should hold them responsible for the inability of the students from that zone to assess the phone because there's a process and the process said look you will send a list and the list will have to be verified and uh, the, the agencies made that known to virtually all the, all the 19 states that are participating in the, in the exercise. And other institutions from other zones sent their lists, and the lists were verified. And on the basis of that, they were paid. But the institutions in the southeast refused or failed to send 
the list for verifications. I think that's exactly what is responsible. And the statement yesterday also uh, appealed to the institutions in, in that zone to send the list as quickly as possible because is their is there right? They are citizens and it's something they should benefit from. So I, I, I think um, with that statement yesterday, I'm sure the institutions in, those, in that zone will make it um, as a matter of urgency to send the list for verification so that students from that zone can also be part of the exercise. It says two cops trade that killed as police share its clash in Abuja again. It's a frequent occurrence wherever the Islamic movement of Nigeria, otherwise known as Shiites, hold their procession in Nigeria. I mean, they often in Abuja and Kaduna as well because they have a base in Kaduna. Um, um, these processions have been banned, but they continue to gather, you know, for uh, street marches, and this one turned out violent as, as usual. Indeed. Just, just to add a word before I, I get to that, uh, it, it's a bad thing to shoot yourself in the leg. And that's why sometimes when you read stories, you know, on the surface value, you have to go deep in. Because even the Nascokos are now turning to the East and telling them, take this opportunity, get the verification done. It's not the nail phone that is causing it. It's you if you're not sending your people in. Then on this uh, 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 issue with, what's the name again? Shiite. 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 You know. The question to really ask is, why is it that, they're not the only organization around town. Why is it that every time there gets to be issues with them, is their word against the police? You were so ashamed of this morning. Uh, some policemen were killed, you know, in a very bad way. And some, some other people lost their lives. One doesn't know quite where the issue is. But if they are banned, the question then arises, should they be matching? You know, if they are matching, are they matching uh, in accordance with the law? And then on the, on the side of the police, if, if they're trying to stop them, are they also doing it in accordance with the, the law? But the, the, the most important thing is, why is it that always, almost at all times, there seems to arise a problem when they match? Well, big question. Let's move on to Vanguard newspaper. Executive order on medicaments, federal government yet to implement two months after. The presidential executive order was... Uh, aimed at reducing the cost of uh, essential medicines and generally revamp the health sector. Delays in the implementation have pushed back the timeline for its takeoff. I mean, I remember that in June, the president signed this executive order and it was aimed at exempting pharmaceutical industry from tariffs, excise duties, in order to support a struggling industry in the midst of the hardship in the country. But two months later, we are hearing that this hasn't been implemented. And one of the reasons is that a framework has not been set up. It's still in the works. It means that you make announcements <laughs> without actually doing the work, first of all, Dr. Yebosa. Yeah, I remember when that executive order was signed by, by the president, we all applauded it. Uh, Nigerians uh, were happy, uh, believing that um, it will enable people to have access to med med um, health care. Because today, if you look at Nigerians today, the cost of drugs is very high. And this is due to many importations of, uh, of, of these drugs. So the whole idea was to you know, make it possible for Nigerians to access um, 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 health care, you know, in various hospitals across the country. But unfortunately, like the paper uh, uh, report this morning, uh, nothing has been done since the executive uh, order was signed. But I think there's no better time to implement that, to implement that than now. I, I think the federal government should take a, a, a step further to ensure that uh, that executive order uh, is implemented. So, yeah, Nkechi had something to yeah, say. Yeah, I just wanted to say it's easy to just throw words like expedite, mm. framework, these signing executive exactly. orders. Mm -hmm. And like I always say, you have to plan these things. Mm -hmm. Listen, if you want to uh, put in a policy and you think that policy would not be ready to be implemented in nine months, you have to communicate and say, look, this is what we're planning to do, maybe just to give hope to the people. But when you come and sign an executive order and say we're going to kick this off, this um, issue is a matter of life and death. It's very important. Pharmacies are reporting that, look, people are skipping their medications, people with chronic conditions, hypertension, and then you have this high cost of drugs combined with 
the high cost of living, uh, well, many Nigerians are now left to choose between their health and also their daily survival. And so I think it's, it seems like a simple concept, communication, a simple concept, planning, but we just don't seem to get it right. This is like one of the many policy delays that we've seen, um, in, in, not just in recent times, really, in Nigeria. Well, what about a plan first of all before you announce? Maybe, exactly. Maybe that's, that's, maybe that's better. No, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah. will tell you, uh, start out with the end right. from the beginning. Right. Yeah, you because if you that. don't start out with the you end, you need to know what you're, you're what, your, your, uh, what you're going to achieve. Okay, Delhi Independent. Sarab asked minister governors to disclose details of Chinese loans and liabilities. The Social Economic Rights and Accountability Project says these loans, guaranteed by the federal government, is a huge exposure to China and other creditors and therefore must be clarified. I mean, Sarab has a point here. You cannot fought the demand especially given the risk of default and how this can negatively impact the country you have seen stories across africa of chinese or china seizing assets because the loans uh, were, were were not paid uh, dr yobosa sarah but uh, if we must also look at it very well uh, this 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 figures this data is, is available in the dmo website uh, we know the amount of money various states borrow from different parts of the country, and they have it in the, in the DMO website. Uh, but I, I think what Sarah is concerned about is uh, the fact that sometimes you take this load and you don't utilize it, you don't account for it, there's lack of accountability, there's lack of transparency. In the way of manner, the government at subnational sub level use this fund. They, you use a loan, you, you borrow money for the purpose of uh, uh, you know, growing the economy, developing infrastructures. But at the end of the day, this fund end up, end, end up uh, in, the, in the pocket of some of these uh, governors uh, who, who do not account for the way and manner the money was used. I, I think that's a, that is the concern of Serap. Otherwise, the data is available at the DMO website. Very good concern. Let's move to the international top stories. Cities in South Africa. Why is a Greek's missing 500 million rand calls for a probe into what money was spent on? Organs of civil society have, you know, kind of um, uh, lauded the agri minister for launching a probe after he uncovered a 500 million rand scandal in the departments, in the ministry. He said, and I quote, we will see accountability and potentially recovery if any wrongdoing is uncovered. There's also the Corruption Watch Executive Director Karam Singh. He said, these are historically challenged departments plagued by deep-seated corruption. I mean, it's a huge hindrance to development, corruption. It undermines institutions as well as erodes trust, doesn't it, Indy? The question, I, 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 do, I don't know how we get, get to do these things. I mean, if you take money for a particular purpose, why don't you use it for that purpose? What's all the... <clears throat> gathering of the money for what's all they trying to they call it war chest that's why you see uh, the elections going on in america every money say follow the money every money is trapped uh, i think one thing that we have to um, probably work at is being able to follow the money at the national level at the state level at the local government go government level when we begin to follow the money then people that take loans, that's one. And then deterrent when you fold on your loans, both locally and internationally. And then people will begin to now take loans specifically for something and be able to do that which the loans were taking for. Instead of piling up loans, uh, piling up debts for the next government and power, and then not even using the loan for what it was supposed to be used for in the, in the first place. Well, th this particular dec discovery is being seen as a, an encouraging sign, and the minister has said we will get to the bottom of it. I so, think, Constance, so, so I, th that, I yes. think better is prevention. Right. I, I mm. think th th they should be looking at prevention instead of always saying, let's go and I start. I mean, it's, uh, it's been done now, and I think he's just focusing on the consequences of what that money was supposed to be used for, right. and it wasn't used for. So hopefully yeah. he succeeds in this investigation. Mm. Well, let's see. Washington post uh you boss i'd like to bring you up uh in here 
Israel Hezbollah has changed heavier strikes in months in a dramatic but contained escalation. The exchange on Sunday night uh, stopped short of all-out war with Hezbollah and Israel both uh, signal in some restaurant. I mean, since July, when the Hezbollah commander and Hamas commander, you know, uh, were killed, it, it's been an ongoing conflict. Uh, you know, the, the, the problem in that region has, has, has gone up a notch, and people have been fearing that it will be an all all out war and here we are, uh, Dr. Yobosa. Absolutely. When the political head of Hezbollah was killed, well, they did vow that they were going to retaliate and uh, I'm sure they did that during the week. And uh, of course, trust is right to also, you know, file back and they've done that. So, and that's what informed the, the heavy exchange of uh, uh, fire uh, uh, a few days ago. But the truth of the matter is that the entire world is concerned about what is happening between the Israel and Gaza. Uh, we've seen a lot of children have been killed, uh, even, at a, even at the medical center. A lot of children have been killed. So many people have been killed. So many innocent people have been killed. As, as, as at the last count, about 171 journalists have been killed, you know, as a result of the, uh, the war between Gaza and Israel. For me, it is unhelpful. It is unacceptable. I think the entire world, especially the UN, should find a way to resolve that matter as quickly as possible. Because at the end of the day, is not helping anybody at all. Well, let's see if they're able to cobble together a ceasefire. They've been trying to do that forever. It hasn't happened. But quickly, before we run out of time, Daily Star, that's a, a light, on a lighter note, 24C Scotch Hill. It's August <laughs> bank holiday and the sun's out, thumbs out. <laughs> this can only get hotter. We are in for a sizzler as a 24 oh. centigrade subtropical. <laughs> now so I understand. Get what away. Phew, what a scotch. I mean, you know, <laughs> men are always the accusing women of being fat. Well, look at their tummies. <laughs> That's <laughs> what you call punch. I mean, They're developing punch. Daily and Star that is, is known <laughs> for <laughs> their... Let <laughs> let them talk. <laughs> all right, all right. Daily all right. Star is known for their cheeky tabloid, <laughs> and this is just one of them. Oh, and you know, God. the British uh -huh. have this... There's this stereotype that they're obsessed with talking about the weather. Yes. And whenever the sun's out, buns are out. <laughs> That's what they used to say. Now, Daily Star is saying, thumbs are, are out. Everyone will be by the beach. Everybody will be on the streets <laughs> in their slippers and shorts. And it's bank holiday. Um, as it's bank holiday this August as well. So they'll have fun. British weather is quite bipolar. And so whenever they see any sun, I mean, 24 degrees Celsius, we have, what, 30 degrees Celsius, 35 degrees Celsius here every day. You know, you know I'm, so, I'm laughing seriously <laughs> because there are some people who we know yes. who have this big gantuan, you know, <laughs> protruding bellies that you call ponds. I hope they are listening. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, I have to be here before we go. Men in Nigeria are always saying, oh, you put on some weather. I'm like, look at your tummy. It's no, but, no, but some <laughs> people like it, your boss and myself, you can see our tummies are flat. You know, you, know, you know, in Nigeria, big tummy is evidence of good living. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. that is just... <laughs> Please. <laughs> It's not. <laughs> so Mr. Not. Yobosa basically saying he's not having some good life or good living. Oh, <laughs> and gosh. Indy as well. Is yeah. that what I you mean, how can say? you say that? <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. I think that's where we leave it today. Thank you so much, Mr. Yobosa. Thank you, Dr. Ikoku, for joining us this morning and sharing your thoughts and staring the boat with yep. us for <laughs> newspaper <laughs> review on Daybreak. Up next, we'll have the morning show. It's a full day ahead and every moment matters. I'm Kate Cheat. No, no. It's a nice one, Constance. Thank well, you. Very nice one. <laughs> Fantastic. I am Ndi. I'm going to thank you for watching.